All right, so we're going to continue with fabrics uh, and we are going to talk about other fabrication methods. So we talked about woven fabrics and weaving. We talked about knitting. Now we're going to talk about other techniques that are used to make textile materials and fabrics. We can make fabrics from yarns, like in the case of knitting and weaving, but we can also make them directly from solutions. So you can use solutions, you can put them on a cast and that will give you films or foam structures that are considered textile materials. Uh, we'll talk about animal products like leather and fur. We did talk a little bit about composite fabrics. I'll talk a little uh, more in detail about composites. Composites are basically materials that combine uh, different kinds of fabrics or textiles. Uh, we can also use yarns to make braiding, braided fabrics uh, or lace and some products like that. These are also interesting uh, construction methods for fabrics. And then directly from fibers, we can make non-wovens. Non-wovens don't use yarns, they use fibers directly and create fiber webs. So I'll talk about different methods to make non-woven materials. Fiber fill is basically using fibers as a filling for different products. We'll talk a little bit about top of cloth, felt that's made out of wool and other net like structures like nets and meshes and things like that. So we talked about films. Um, in this case, your solution is extruded through a slit or a cast and you create a film structure when it dries out and coagulates. Those are very uniform in appearance and in quality because you're not using yarns, you're not interlacing or interlooping anything. It is just a solution that you dry out. So it's basically you put it in a mold and you let it dry, you create a textile surface. You can emboss them to make it look like leather. So a lot of faux leather products are made out of uh, films. They are water impermeable, air impermeable. They don't really feel very breathable actually because they don't allow any kind of air or water to pass through. They're resistant to soils. Uh, but they can be weak. So this is an example of a film. So for films, you'll see vinyl films or polyurethane films. Uh, and sometimes those films are used as a coating on a different textile material. Some of those are washable and dry cleanable. Some of those like vinyl doesn't work well with dry cleaning. Um, this is another one that is made to look more like a leather surface. And we can make films uh, as expanded films or supported films. You can coat fabrics with a film. So your base might be a woven or knit structure and you just put a film on top of it as a coating. Or you can expand the films. You can create a soft, more drapeable kind of film structure as well. Foams are more airy and springy. They're lightweight because uh, they're created by creating a lot of air bubbles inside. Foams are used for padding, for upholstery, mattresses, carpeting. Those are a lot airier, springier, and lightweight products. Animal products like leather and fur are made out of animal skins and animal furs. And they go through certain processes. So I'm actually going to pass this really quick because I'm going to go into detail about this in my next uh, video. Uh, now, composite fabrics, these are fabrics that combine several structures into one textile material. So these are coated fabrics, polymeric fabrics, suede like fabrics, flocked fabrics, tufted pile, laminates, stitch bonded, quilted fabrics. All of these fabrics use more than one type of textile and combine them together. Coated fabrics are usually fabrics that have a regular base, like a woven or knit base, and you coat them with a film. You can attach the film to the fabric by either lamination or calendaring or coating. Lamination is when you melt 
the film to make it stick on the fabric surface. Calendaring is basically a similar process, except it goes through hot calendars, hot cylinders, uh, and kind of melts and sticks the film into the fabric. I mean, onto the fabric surface. And coating is you can use a hot film that is fluid, that's still like a solution, and you just apply it with a knife or a roller. The characteristics of coated fabrics is that because there's a film surface on the top, they are impermeable to water. So a lot of wind parkas or rain coats are usually coated with a film that is water impermeable so that you don't get wet when you're wearing it. It does feel hot and clammy because they're not very breathable. And we use coated fabrics for upholstery, for luggages, bags, apparel, and coats, you know, things like that. This is an outdoor grill cover that is made of coated fabrics. So you can see the film is on the top surface, but if you peel the film, you can see the fabric structure here. It looks like a woven material on the bottom and it's coated with a film. So the film protects it from the rain, from the water, from rotting and so on, because it's water impermeable, even though this fabric here may not be water impermeable. Poromeric fabrics usually have microporous polymers on the surface. So these are microporous membranes. They have micro level pores. on. They don't allow bigger molecules to pass through. So they are breathable, but they are also not going to soak you in in the in case of rain, because water molecules like H2O will be too big to pass through those micropores. Suede-like fabrics are fabrics that are needle punched, um, especially with microfibers that are combined with some resin coating, and they look like suede, but they're not really suede. Flocked fabrics are fabrics that have a fiber surface. So there may be just extra fibers that are used that are glued on the surface, or sometimes they are uh, mechanically attached to the surface and so on. Tufted fabrics, these are mostly upholstery and carpets. This is when you are using yarns on top of a fabric. So these are composites because you're using an extra yarn and you're putting that on top of a fabric and the back is usually coated. So there's a coating, there's a fabric and there's extra yarn. So it's combining all of those different materials. The yarns are stitched to create the piles on the surface. So we call them tufted fabrics. And then once the yarns are stitched onto it, then you coat the bottom so that those piles don't come off the fabric. Uh, so carpets, generally tufted carpets go through this process and some imitation velvet. So when you look at this yarn here, this, this is your fabric cross section. Okay, you see your warp and filling yarn. So this is a woven primary fabric. And then you use these yarns, you kind of stitch them through and create the piles. You can cut the piles or you can leave them uncut. And then you coat the bottom of the fabric so that these piles don't come off the fabric. This is something you would see on uh, bath, bathroom mats or some of those indoor mats. You'll see a backing, you'll see the piles on the front. So I'm gonna show you some, this is a tufted rug. Uh, this is a cotton rug with uncut piles. This one has cut piles. It's a bathroom rug made out of nylon. This is a bath rug again. You see the piles here. So these piles are created on this fabric surface. And then on the back of this mat, you will see a coating that holds those loops, the stitches, on the back of the mat together so that they don't come off. This is a tufted carpet with uncut piles here. 
laminated fabrics usually connect one or two fabric layers together using some kind of wet adhesive. Sometimes a hot melt method can be used. You can also bond these structures with foam. You can also bond, bond um, fabrics by stitching. So you can use warp knitting machines and you can interlace the fibers or yarns to lock them together. All right, so this is a composite material because it's combining different layers. So this is a non-woven layer. This is a non-woven layer and the middle is a microporous membrane. These are laminated between two non-woven layers. So this is your top layer, this is your bottom layer, and this is used for protective apparel. So this is kind of like the part of maybe a mask. The microporous membrane allows the breathability and this fabric is laminated in these spots. Another composite fabric is quilted fabrics. You can quilt, you can create quilted fabrics uh, using two layers of fabric. You can use thread to quilt. When you have a thermoplastic layer, you can use the pinsonic method and fuse them together, or you can use chemical adhesives. This one is quilted using thread. There are other composite structures like supported scrimp structures, uh, fiber reinforced materials, so these type of materials usually use fibers, but they also add resins and they combine everything together. Uh, one example of this would be skateboards, for example. You know, those use some textile material inside, but it also uses resin and it creates this sturdy surface. So these are materials that use fibers for reinforcement. Composite fabrics have a lot of advantages when you're combining one, two, three different type of textile structures together and either coating them or laminating them or fusing them together. Um, there are advantages. One thing is you create interesting textures. They're usually lightweight, uh, especially composite fabrics or fiber reinforced materials. They use fabrics to make it lightweight, you know, instead of using like metal pieces or heavier type of structures when you use textiles and combine them together that creates a lightweight uh, material it gives more body to the fabric there's less wrinkling that way they're quick to produce and they're stable and they're well done the disadvantages of these fabrics that are coated or laminated is sometimes they separate for example, if they're glued, sometimes it's not very permanent, it may separate. They can be off grain. That's an issue because, you know, each textile material that you're combining together have to be on the same grain. Um, sometimes they shrink differently and that causes problems and puckering on the fabric. They can sag, they can be bulky, they can be stiff. So those are some of the issues with that. Now to make uh, fabric from yarns, we can knit, we can weave fabrics when we are using yarns as our raw material, but there's also the braiding technique. So let me just show you how braiding works. Right, so this is a braiding machine. I'm going to turn the sound off. So you see the yarns here, and when it works, uh, the yarns are making kind of like a maple dancing. If you know maple dancing, they go around each other, out and in. Okay, so now you can see that the yarns are moving. So they are all turning around braiding. And here your braided fabric is being made. This is usually used to make hoses, for example or sometimes shoelaces are made in this method and you get that final product coming up right here. So as the yarns are braiding on the top, your braided uh, structure is being pulled as you go. Okay. So that's braiding. Another fabric you can make from yarns is lace. Lace materials are usually intermeshed yarns 
They have a lot of open spaces. They can be woven, they can be knit, they can be crocheted. Um, so you can use a lot of different methods to create lace. You can make it by hand, you can make it by machine. Let me see if this video comes up. This is called bobbin lace and you have your yarns. This is done by hand. So you usually use these pillows and you pin your yarns that you're not using. And then you take those, you twist them like that. And then you have to twist them uh, one more time. So if you're watching this carefully, now you create this, you pin it. I mean, it's a long process. You would be, you would have to be very patient to create lace doing this by hand. I've seen some people do this and of course they do it so fast. You can't even follow what they're doing. In this video, it's being done really slowly. All right, so let's continue. Um, there are different kinds of lace. You can also create lace by uh, the Shifley embroidery machines. Uh, there's Lever's lace. I'll show you some pictures of that on iTextiles. Um, other than lace, there are other open mesh fabrics like macrame, net, and so on. And you can use hand knotting or you can use certain knitting machines to create those structures as well. This is a trico knit netting. This is done on a warp knit machine, on a trico machine. So it's making loops to create this structure. Uh, this is lace. This is a crochet. This is hand crocheted acrylic blanket. Uh, this is a lace made with Rochelle knit machine, warp knit machine. This one uses some knitting methods. These are weft knitting. Embroidery is another way you can construct some uh, type of textile structure. So I'm going to show you some pictures. Uh, these are hand embroidered. So this little pouch here is done by hand embroidering this, these flowers on it. So you can see the close-up views of them and there are sequins attached to this as well. You can also machine embroider uh, by using embroidery machines. So this one is a machine embroidered fabric. Uh, this is called an eyelet embroidery. So there's a plain view fabric, but you're using the embroidery on top of that plain view fabric to create this look. Um, this is an embroidery done on a jersey, on a jersey fabric. So the base is jersey, and this uh, is created by embroidering over a jersey fabric. This is an embroidered stretch knit fabric. This is the face. You can see the embroidery here. This is the back. And now let's talk about making fabrics directly from fibers. Those would be non-woven materials generally, and they create webs, uh, fiber webs, which create surfaces. Uh, so for example, a paper would be considered a non-woven material because papers are made directly from fibers. The interfacing materials that we use in garment production, those are non-woven fabrics usually. There are three different methods to make non-wovens. And one is a mechanical method. The second one uses heat and the third one uses chemical materials. So basically what you're doing in here is you're taking fibers, creating a fiber web and making sure they bond together so that they create a surface. So you can bond all these fibers by mechanical methods, which means you're just entangling all the fibers together so that they stay in that fiber web or you can heat them and melt them so that they stick together in certain sections, or you can use adhesives to keep them together. This is a disposable diaper. And this one, you can see that those little spots here have uh, been fused together. So this uses heat to connect those layers together uh, and also to keep the fibers from separating from each other. 
Tea bags are non-woven fabrics. And you can see that there is no woven structure. There is no knit pattern. This is just fibers laid together and they are uh, created like this as a web. It's almost like paper. So we use two main methods, dry laid or wet laid method when we're using staple fibers or short fibers to make non-wovens. You're basically arranging all the fibers in a random orientation. And sometimes you can use laminating or coating. A wet laid is when you arrange the fibers on some kind of water mixture. Here you can see the fibers laid parallel to each other. Spawn bonding is another method we use that lays continuous filaments on a conveyor belt and then fuses them or uses heat to bond them together. Um, a lot of our masks are created by spawn bonding the fibers together. Some layers inside a mask, you'll find that they are spawn bonded. Sometimes they're hydro entangled, which means you're using water jets to create, to create some kind of pattern and then entangle them and let them stay that way. Spawn bonding is used in carpets, geotextiles, envelopes, filters, protective apparel. So when I say filters, again, masks are usually um, produced by spawn bonding fibers and those fibers create a layer inside your mask where uh, the viruses get stuck inside that uh, tortuous fiber environment and it doesn't pass through the layer. So there are, there's the melt blowing method, uh, spun melt. You know, these are different methods you can use to create non-woven fabrics. You see in this case, this one is thermally bonded in these sections. So you are passing this material through these hot cylinders, which are embossed with these squares on top of them. And when the cylinder is heated, as soon as it touches these sections, it melts and allows all the fibers to bond together. And so the entangled pieces throughout the web doesn't separate. This one is also a spun bonded fabric. The fibers are melted to bond together with heat. A mechanical method is needle punching. So there are needle punched non-woven fabrics where you use barbed needles to entangle the fibers mechanically. The chemical method uses glue or some kind of chemical. So this is the needle punching method. So you have all these barbed needles and this is your fiber web and the needles are going up and down entangling all the fibers, preventing them from um, separating. So the needles are usually like this. So when you keep pushing them up and down, all these fibers get entangled and they don't really come off each other. This is a better picture of those barbed needles. This is a picture of the chemical bonding process where you have an adhesive and you have your uh, fibers you are laying the fibers on top of the adhesive and you're creating this uh, structure which is bonded, okay? And in the thermal bonding method, we are using hot cylinders. And when the hot cylinder goes around the fabric, you see these spots that are heated, they create, um, they, they fuse the material together so that the web stays together. This one here, you can see that it is fused at these spots and the web doesn't separate. Okay, so those are the methods. Now let's just go, we're just gonna go to iTextiles now. All right, so let's just summarize everything through your iTextiles. We talked about non-woven fabrics. 
uh, I didn't mention tapa cloth or felt. So tapa is a traditional cloth that is made in the islands in the Pacific Ocean. That is something that people make by hand using strips of inner bark of a mulberry tree. Felt is made using wool fabrics. And remember, wool fibers have those scales around them and that allows them to kind of stick together when you rub them and agitate them. Um, and especially if you use heat, uh, it, they get all entangled because of the scales holding onto each other. So we create felt this way. Okay, so these are materials that we use in textiles as well. This is a tapa cloth. Like I said, you are using the inner bark of the mulberry tree. You soak them and then scrape them. And it's almost like making paper. This is a felt material. This is the magnified V of felt where wool fibers are all entangled and it's impossible to remove those entanglements. Uh, this is a hat made out of felt. This here is the felt and they embroidered on top of it. We talked about non-woven fabrics that are made directly from fibers. And we said there are three methods, chemical, mechanical, and thermal. So disposable bo booties like this, these are uh, used in hospitals usually or in clean areas where they want you to put them on your shoes. And these, this is the magnified view. And this is a non-woven structure where it is fused by using heat. So these little squares are where um, the fiber web is heated and melted so that you don't lose that web structure. Tea bags, we talked about tea bags. Um, this winter glove has the tinselate interlining. This is non-woven fabric that is used in the inside. We talked about Tyvek, which is made out of olefin. Those are basically paper-like structures that we create out of olefin fibers. And that helps us protect uh, buildings from during construction when there's wind or rain, you know, it, it just protects the building. We talked about wet laying and dry laying processes. So these are different processes where you can create non-woven fabrics. So we talked about needle punching as a mechanical method. Uh, hydro entanglement uses water to entangle. Stitch bonding uses stitches to entangle and keep the fiber web together. So this is a needle punched non-woven fabric. This is hydro entangled non-woven and this is a stitch bonded non-woven fabric. The thermal bonding uses heat. The chemical bonding uses resins or other adhesives. We talked about composites or multi-component fabrics, like quilted fabrics, bonded fabrics, laminated fabrics, coated fabrics. So this is quilted using thread. This one is threadless stitching, which means they used heat to fuse uh, the fabric to create the quilt structure. We talked about laminated and bonded fabrics. We talked about coated fabrics. So this one has a knit backing and then on top of the knit, they coated it with this film that looks kind of like leather. So when you peel off the uh, film on top of knit fabric, you can see the knit structure at the bottom. We talked about lace and open mesh and net structures. So this is a tattered lace, this is a crochet lace, this is a handmade filet lace. This is made on a Rochelle warp knitting machine. This is made on a Chircon warp knitting machine. And this is made on a weft knit machine. I showed you guys the video about bobbin lace. There's also needle or point lace. There's fillet lace, Badenberg lace, 
So these are different kinds of laces. So I showed you the bobbin lace in the video. This is called a fillet lace. It is handmade using stitches. This is handmade needle lace using needles. You can create this lace. This is a Battenberg lace or tape lace. And then there are open mesh fabrics like knitted lace, crochet lace, tated lace. Well, this kind of lace is done using uh, these shuttles. These are tiny little shuttles. They're almost like a needle that you're using to create this by hand. This is also something that takes a ton of time. Other open mesh fabrics. Uh, this is the weft knit lace fabric. This is made on a lever's lace machine. This is lace produced on a Shifley embroidery machine. This is a machine lace made on a Rochelle warp knitting machine. Another Rochelle warp knitting lace. Two is usually made with a trico warp knitting machine. We talked about tufted fabrics with piles on them. So this is uh, one of those machines that create the piles. So you are, this is the back of the fabric. You're stitching these yarns into the fabric. On the back of this fabric, on the actual, on the face of this fabric, you can see the piles from these stitches. And to keep those piles in place, you coat the bottom of this fabric. This is a tufted pile fabric. This is the front of the fabric. And this is the back where these yarns are stitched in. And these are the ends of those yarns on the surface. This is a tufted carpet. Now this carpet actually is made of the same color yarns, except some of those are uncut and some of those are cut. So the cut piles look a little bit darker. And these are the uncut piles here when you look at this section here. We talked about braiding. This is a braided look. These are braided fabrics. We use braiding for rugs, cords, uh, wire insulations are made by braiding. Sometimes the handles for gift bags or strings, they can be flat or they can be circular. So now in this case, you have a circular one. So you have a monofilament spandex inside and you are braiding the metallic yarns over that. This handle is made by braiding and this is how it looks. There's hand embroidery like these where you see that these are all embroidered on the surface of the fabric. This is embroidered. These are all hand embroidery. And there are some embroidery machines like this. These baseball caps are embroidered with this machine. Uh, this is a multi-head embroidery machine. So each head is embroidering the same design on this fabric. This is an eyelet embroidery. This is being made on a Shifley embroidery machine. There are also bead and sequin machines where you can create these type of surfaces on the fabric, okay? Okay, and let's talk a little bit about other materials quickly. Uh, we did talk a little bit about leather fur, uh, there's faux leather, faux fur, and uh, you can see that nowadays we can make those um, products that resemble leather or uh, products that resemble fur out of synthetic materials. Now leather is a natural product that we obtain from the skin of animals. And majority of leather is made uh, from cowhide. Uh, so we call it a hide when we are using the skin of the animal. Those can be mammals, reptiles, fish, bird, and then it has to go through a tanning process. 
So tanning is a chemical finish to make the skin pliable and water and rot resistant. We also bleach leather. We can dye it, we can emboss it, we can print on it, we can glaze it, and so on. So there are a lot of finishes we can do. Uh, just some of the terminology, leather is the tanned skin or hide of animals. Hides are the skin of the animal that is used for leather. Uh, grain is the marking that results from the skin formation. This is a cross-section of leather. Um, we use leather in apparel, upholstery, wall coverings, athletic gear like gloves, bowls, saddles, uh, luggages, bags, accessories, wallets. We use leather in all kinds of products. Leather does pick up oil and grease, so you have to be careful. And dry cleaning is generally required for leather. So when I talked about top grain leathers, this would be a full grain leather here. And sometimes we split leather and use the separate layers of it. So the top part is called the top grain. And of course, full grain leather is much better quality than any of the other ones. Uh, we use a lot of animals for their leather, for their skin or hide. Uh, sheep, goat, buffalo, deers, pigs. Um, we also use reptiles and large birds for leather, like snakes, alligators, stingrays, and ostriches. So there are different types of leather. Um, there are the kinds that we use um, for gloves and things like that, that are a little bit softer, a little bit thinner, but then there are other ones that we use for, uh, for example, briefcases or things like that. Now, um, I did mention that we call it a full grain leather when we are using the outer layer uh, that has the grain. And this is the highest quality leather. So if I can show you this really quick here. So if you remember this, if this is leather, full grain would be using both the outer layer and all the other layers together. And uh, sometimes the leather is split into separate layers and each separate pieces are called, called split, split leather. The top area where it contains the grain is called the top grain leather. So full grain leather is the highest quality leather uh, and then there's top grain, which doesn't include the topmost part of the outer layer, um, but it usually has like a corrected grain. So the outer surface is sanded uh, to remove all the scars. It is a durable type of piece and we can use it in furniture bags and other leather items. But this is a split leather. Uh, split is the flesh side of the leather, so it doesn't have any grain. Uh, this is a split leather suede fabric. Tanning is a process we go through for leather. We talked about this. So this process preserves the leather and prevents it from cracking. It also helps the leather become more pliable so you can sew and make garments with it. So we are basically treating leather with fats and oils to make it a little bit softer, a little bit pliable. And we use certain chemicals to make it durable so that it doesn't smell, it doesn't go bad and rot over time. We can emboss, uh, we can sand, we can buff leather. So we can do a lot of finishes on a leather material. Um, embossing gives a certain pattern to the surface. Sometimes we use this to um, make, for example, cowhide to look like alligator skin or snake skin. This is an embossed alligator skin pattern on a regular hide. Uh, this is a sanded leather. So sanding gives the surface a softer look. It removes all the scars and imperfections. Uh, suede fabrics are generally sanded leather. We can also do enameling, lacquering. Uh, there's pearlized leather. You use a fine reflective powder on the surface to give it a subtle shine. 
This is lacquered, this is pearlized and embossed at the same time. Or you can do repellent finishes, water repellent, stain repellent finishes on the surface of the feather as well. This is a suede fabric. Suede is done by sanding the flesh side of the leather. Basically, split leather is sanded to produce some kind of a nap on the surface. And this is called a suede. Um, you can also uh, make a thin suede leather from sheep or deer skin. We call it a chemoise. Nabuk is a little bit different. It's kind of similar to suede, but this is uh, when you have the leather with the grain side sanded or buffed, uh, and it makes a, a suede-like surface. It creates a suede-like surface. So it resembles suede, but it's not considered suede because it's the grain side that's sanded. On suede, we usually use the flesh side um, there's Napa, which is full grain leather. Uh, Napa leather is generally, if you, if you see the word Napa, that means full grain leather, that means it's pretty good quality. Um, and that generally comes from sheep, lamb, or goat skin. When it's hair on leather, that means the hair of the animal is on. We talked about kid or kid skin. Um, this is the general term for leather. We use in gloves or shoes that we make out of goat skin. Exotic hides are hides or skins that we use from uh, animals like zebras or snakes, crocodiles, alligators, ostriches, eels, sharks. Um, so those are a little more exotic, generally a little more expensive. Um, you can also do finishes on regular cowhide to create an exotic leather look. So this one is a cow uh, skin, but we use this, we emboss and do certain finishes on it to make it look like snake skin because it's less expensive to use cowhide. And a lot of those hides that we use from cow, cows and sheep they come from the meat industry. So these are animals we already kill for the meat and we use their skin for leather as well. Um, there's also leather that um, is reconstituted or um, bonded or shredded. This is not necessarily considered leather because it's made with some leather or non-leather materials mixed together. It's almost like a recycled type of material. Um, of course, you know, with leather, there are a lot of ethical issues, environmental issues. Animal rights activists are against using real leather. There's a trend to use other materials that look like leather instead of using the actual leather. Uh, so they call it vegan leather, they call it faux leather. Uh, so those are materials that resemble leather, but they're made out of some kind of synthetic material. So usually vinyl or other type of uh, polymeric materials are used to create faux leather or imitation leather. Uh, polyurethane, polyvinyl chloride, uh, which is vinyl fabrics. So those are used uh, for imitation leather. Of course, you know, the problem with imitation leather is that they will crack, they will start to split, and they're not going to last forever like actual leather does. This is a full leather bag, and you can see the surface is embossed, and they created a very leather-like look. Um, I actually have a purse that looks just like this, so I'm thinking this is a Steve Madden purse. Uh, and nowadays they make them look uh, a whole lot like actual leather. This is another faux leather uh, belt made with snakeskin pattern, but it is made out of vinyl materials. So uh, this material actually has a vinyl top. The vinyl is embossed to make it look like snake skin. And the backing of this material is a knit fabric, you can see. So they create these type of materials um, to make you know, wallets, handbags, belts, and things like that.
And sometimes we can prefer faux leather because they can be dyed to much brighter colors. They are consistent in their texture. They're available in large quantities because they're just mass produced. Uh, they don't come from animals. So you can create a big roll of these fabrics and you can lay them out and cut them, make anything you want. So there's more flexibility with faux leather. They're generally lightweight. It's easy to clean them and they can get some antimicrobial treatment on the fabric. Fur is another um, one of those fabrics that are becoming less and less popular because of animal rights activists um, and because of the trend to go more animal friendly, environmentally friendly with other type of materials that look like fur. But fur is the uh, any animal skin where the hair and the fleece uh, are still attached to the skin. We go through a dressing process. This is similar to tanning that we do for leather. We do dressing for fur. This keeps the skin from petrifying and makes them soft and pliable so you can sew garments. You don't want to have a lot of shedding, so that's important. The hairs should be firmly attached. It should be pliable. It should be order free. Furs require special care and special storage. So you can't just wash your fur products in the washing machine. Uh, you can't just dry clean them. There's a special fur cleaning that has to be done. And you can also not just store them anywhere. Sometimes people rent a farrier storage and put their fur products there. Fur should be protected from abrasion as well to keep the hairs intact. There are different qualities of fur also. There's the under fur or under coat. This is the shorter, finer layer of hair next to the skin. Um, and then there's the guard hair, which is the coarser, longer, and more lustrous outer hair. Fur is generally used in the winter because it provides a lot of uh, warmth especially when the weather is cold. Obviously, you know, animals don't wear coats because they have the fur to protect them from the cold. So you can see this is the guard hair, it is the longer hair. Um, the undercoat or under fur is usually the shorter, far, finer layer of hair next to the skin. Uh, we obtain fur from wild animals, but also sometimes there are fur manufacturers which just have their fur farms and ranches, and they breed those animals only for fur. Mink and fox fur are obtained from animals generally raised on ranches in the US and in Canada. Wild fur come from beavers, raccoons, sables, wild mink, bobcat, coyotes, those type of animals in the wild. Now in the US, uh, a lot of animals uh, are in the banned category, especially endangered species, um, seals, you know, those are animals you cannot use their fur. It's banned in the United States. You can also not use the fur of cats and dogs. Mink fur, uh, this is a mink fur example. It is shiny with soft guard hair. Um, wild mink is generally brown. If it is farm raised, it's black, white, or in mixed colors. Uh, it's one of the more expensive types of fur. Fox fur is this one here. This is usually obtained from the wild or from ranch uh, raised animals, farm raised animals. Uh, this has long, soft guard hair as well. And there are different colors, different kinds of foxes. Um, this is a blue fox fur, this is a crystal fox fur, this is a red fox fur. Uh, this is a beaver fur, this has long shiny guard hair, and the under fur is also dense. So under fur is basically the short hairs that are closer to the skin. This is sable fur, that's very soft and dense, uh, relatively shorter. This is lynx fur, again, soft, coyote fur that is thick and durable. 
we usually use these uh, for men's clothing. These are the one of the cheapest ones you can get. Most furs are used with the leather side inside the garment or in the final product. In shearling, the leather side of lamb pelt is suede and used on the outside. Pelt is uh, basically what we call the skin with the fur uh, attached to it. So when you, when you get fur, you have to thin the skin a little bit, clean it, lubricate it, and then you have to clean the fur side, brush it and press it and so on. Most furs are used with the leather side on the uh, inside of the garment or in the final product. There are different processes fur materials can go through. You can shear them to make the hair lengths more uniform. Uh, you can dye them into a different color. Tip dyeing is when you're dyeing um, the guard hair tips mostly to give it a more uniform look. Of course, there are certain laws and regulations about using fur as well, because uh, there's some animal cruelty issues that comes with fur manufacturers. So a lot of animal rights activists are also against the use of actual fur. Uh, so we use full fur or imitation fur instead. And majority of those materials are produced using acrylic, modacrylic, or polyester fibers and they create the piles and you can make it look a lot like fur. This is a knitted faux fur. So you have these piles here. This is a woven faux fur. So the base is woven and then you have the hairs attached to it. This is a tufted faux fur where the hair is tufted onto the fabric. You can also dye and print on faux fur. So faux fur is a little bit easier to dye and print because actual fur is a little bit more difficult to put like um, different colors on. Uh, this is the same thing for leather. Leather is harder to color or dye to different bright colors because it's hard for the leather to pick up color. Uh, but faux leather is easier to color. So if you see any bright colors of fur, I mean, colors of leather products, that's usually faux leather because the real leather usually comes in very standard colors. And actually leather coloring is a big industry. And usually when they come up with a good color to, to dye leather products, that becomes uh, the fashion color of the year in general, because leather producers have to come up with their colors way ahead of the fashion curve. So with faux fur, you can also process uh, fur in similar ways. You can shear the piles to make it look more uniform. You can also electrify it, which gives the pile, the pile a smooth, lustrous appearance. Faux fur is obviously much cheaper than actual fur. And if you wanna see if something is real fur or uh, not real, one thing you can do is you can check the back of the fabric. If it's visible, you'll see that in faux fur, you have a woven backing or a knit backing. It's usually not the leather. I don't know if I can make this a little bit bigger, but you can see, you know, this is the actual fur backing. This is the faux fur backing. And I can pretty much see here um, the fabric structure here. So it's usually a fabric backing. Another way you can tell if something is real fur or a faux fur is look at the hairs. If the hairs have tips like this, that's normal actual hair. But if the tips look more flat like this, that's faux fur. You can also do a little burn test. Uh, if you guys remember, for example, when we burnt wool, it smelled like burning hair and it formed a bead almost. And then when you crush it, it turns into uh, ashes. So if you can burn it and if it forms a crushable bead, then it's actual fur. But if you burn a little bit and it just starts to melt or smell like plastic, that's usually faux fur. Okay, so that's all I have for leather and fur. And now we have completed fabrics. 
uh, from here on, we're going to talk about fabric finishes, dyeing, printing, and other processes.